to our class today. We just want to do an um, introduction to the concept of data management and analysis. And um, this will be uh, the use of statistical package for social sciences. Now, the objective for this model is to be able to bring you to the relevant terms that you'll be meeting during the course of this particular program. So it's act as an introduction to familiarize you with the key concept or key terms that are um, more uh, used frequently when we are doing what we call data analysis. So this is a very important um, uh, model to familiarize, to put us in the same page as we are progressing with what you call the data analysis journey. So um, uh, welcome once again, my name is Peter Nyachome and uh, I will be the one taking this course. So I just want to bring in to highlight what is it that we call data. Data, Mr. Russell Akov said, um, a psychologist, he indicated that in the mind of all human beings, there are some specific key that are being absorbed in the people's mind very fast. One of it is data. Data is being represented in the human mind with symbols, with numbers with the statistics, the pictures, and the observations and recording. So you will find that now, when you present information in terms of data, it goes deep into human mind and people can be able to recall very easily when you do a good presentation using very good visual display. Then the information is also a component of our human mind. So the data that are processed is called information. Okay? And that information now is a uh, process data, which is now useful for uh, supporting what you call decision making. Okay, we are answering questions with regard to who, what, why, and when of the analysis component. Then in the human mind, there's also a section where knowledge is being processed. So knowledge simply is application of data and the information that is capable of answering our how questions. And then we have the understanding, which is the appreciation of why something is taking place. And now the wisdom is the evaluated understanding of futuristic. We are now applying wisdom to be able to predict the future. We are using data to assist us now predict the future. We can be able to give what you call uh, the, I, 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 the, 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 the forecast. Now the forecast, we are going to make more accurate when we rely on scientific data that you have already collected. So now the journey of what is in the human mind starts with the data at the lowest level, which is the simple representation, the visual, the numbers, the statistical pictures, then we move to information, then we go to knowledge, then that is what generates to the appreciation of what we call as wisdom. Then, now we want to understand what is it that we call data. So data is a collection of facts, such as values or measurements. It can be numbers, words, measurement, observations, or even just description of things can be referred to as data. It is information in raw form. Often we say ungrouped. It has not yet been processed. So it is this statistical package and softwares that will be meant to process for us the data so that at least we can drive a meaning out from it. Because in their own form, we is like a clutter. There are things that are hanging anywhere. So we cannot be able at least to have a meaning. And the processing of the data is the content of this particular course where you process data so that you can be able to have what you call a proper, well-organized information. And remember, before we begin anything, we need to have a focus in our mind on something called what are the various data sources. Any analyst outside there that you want to be data analyst, one of the things that you must at least begin with, your first step, is the data sources. Which kind of data will be arriving 
to my organization in which manner they will be data collected using odk data collected using the monkey survey data collected using google forms data collected using compare secondary data that is from the review of published materials in that organization another instance of our data will be the interviews focus group discussions all these are required you need to understand that is the beginning of your data analysis journey that you begin by understanding the sources by which doctor you will receive the data and then after that try to picture every source how will you synthesize how will you uh, 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 make that data to have a meaning the process of so-called data analysis so when i receive data from the secondary source how can I be able to make a lot of comparison from it so that at least it can give me something that is a meaning? And that is now the process of our research is more interested in trying to compile different uh, uh, researchers' views concerning one particular thing. Now, I talk about this particular researcher. What did he find out? And which kind of the design did he use to be able to arrive at the findings? What about this one also? What were the points of convergence? What are the points of divergence? We are trying to look at the similarities between the authors, the similarity between the researchers, and points of differences where they don't agree, so that we can compile a comprehensive report on that specific variable of my question. So that's the approach that we use when we are doing what you call our research. And even when we are coming to what you call that analysis, the points do not vary. We still maintain looking at our findings vis-a-vis -vis others, our finding with regard to similarities and differences. So that when I talk about my finding 0 0.5, correlation of 0 0.5 or correlation of 0 0.6, I'm so much interested if at all there's any other person who did almost a similar study and arrived at a near, almost near finding of 0 0.6, so that I can have a proper justification that actually regardless of the buying of the methodology of research design, the standard, uh, the, the approach is the answer tends to be above 0 0.5. That is now the general uh, view of my reporting. The answer tends to be above this particular point because now we have used different uh, research design. So and so also applied this research design and it got 0 0.56. This one also got 0 0.66. This one got 0. So I try to see that the answers are almost nearing, almost tending to be almost a, 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 a uh, uh, they are almost converging to a particular point. Therefore, it simply means this is a general truth because we want to differentiate between truth from fictions. So now, uh, that is now how the standard approach that we shall be, uh, uh, our eye view, our mind, what, wherever we are doing our data analysis, our interest is going to uh, table our finding vis-a-vis others because most likely you'll find that we are not the only people who are so much concerned about that particular issue so we are going to find others also in the field so now data types is the second area that i want us to discuss data types there are mainly two different types of data that we shall be finding outside there one is called qualitative data and another one is called quantitative data. Now, the qualitative data are the data type that are based on non-numeric meaning, like behaviors, attitudes of people, their way of behavior. Their way of behavior, if I can collect the way of behavior of people, I can be able at least to try to look at if at all this behavior of people are similar or they are different. And then I go deep to understand what is bringing differences what is bringing what you call similarities, so that I can be able to advise, okay, if you want a behavior of this particular nature, then you need to do the following based on that qualitative analysis that I've already performed. So that is based on trying to identify commonality, trying to identify themes which are similar and making argument out from them so that we are going to arrive at our it's normally called content analysis, so qualitative analysis. And then the one that we shall be doing here is called quantitative analysis. Now, quantitative analysis is based on meaning being driven from numeric 
expression of numbers, number one. So we are going to differentiate between one and 0 0.1. We are going to differentiate between number, number two and number 10. So when I talk about one, what is it, the meaning with regard to the findings that I've already established? What is it that is referred to as 40%? What is it that is called 5%? Now, it is only in statistics where we give multiple numbers meaning. So in this particular course, numbers will get meaning. In mathematics, we don't have meaning, real meaning for numbers because somebody may say the answer is four. So what? What is the meaning of that four? But here, four will have a meaning because four will be given this a V, a comparative, study of a phenomenon and then we give it that four represent this specific it remains this so the meaning of numbers is received during the time that we are dealing with a data type called quantitative analysis and the quantitative analysis is based on us trying to look at what is my main variable of the study now Quantitative analysis, we normally begin with looking at what you call the subject. This subject in this case is what in this case we shall be referring as the dependent variable. So we begin our research with the dependent variable in mind. This is the subject. I normally call it in quantitative studies the most important variable. Now, our interest is what other variables, if we vary, if we change, may bring a different change to this subject, which is called the dependent variable. So that I talk about performance of employees in an organization. Performance is now my subject. Performance in this case is my dependent variable. But I'm so much interested in advising human resource management across the globe on what they need to do to improve this performance so that organization can be able to, since we are getting this performance from the human being, the human capital, what is it that is necessary so that you can do to this human person so that its performance can improve? Therefore, it requires a study. It requires a research because now the research is the general truth of how we arrive at truth in science. Remember, this is a social science. So therefore, we want to be near truth as much as possible. And therefore, we are going to use a methodology that regardless of the kind of person that uses it, the answers remain the same. And that's why we are saying this is a truth. It is a truth because regardless of the person who is going to follow the procedure, the answer is supposed to be the same. Therefore, that particular answer we are going to receive is going to be a truth differentiated from fictions, differentiated from a uh, fact. So we adopt it as a scientific knowledge that has been supported by a given design. And we are also convinced that in the process of collecting that particular information, the standards of research are obeyed. And therefore, we can rely on it to be a fact that is there on the ground. And therefore, we can adopt it generally for decision making. That's what makes us to do what you call. Now, when we are conducting what you call the study, the dependent variable is not very key. We don't try to bring, even when we are starting, what you call your descriptive uh, uh, background of the study, you will find that the approach may not be the same like the quantitative, where you begin with the description of your dependent variable in quantitative studies. It may take a different turn when you are analyzing the qualitative studies. Okay, since we are not interested in hypothesis testing, we are not interested in trying to do a prediction using the results that we are going to get. But in quantitative studies, we do prediction, we do hypothesis testing. Therefore, we are going to just take a sample, which is also must be representative. We must adopt what we call the concept of randomization so that the random sample concept will allow us to do prediction based on the data that we have analyzed. So now I want to take you briefly to the seven attributes, seven categories of data. That's next. What these are seven basic categories of data, types of data that we are going to analyze down there. One is the attributes, what people are, what people are. 
the attributes, the demographic and the socioeconomic characteristic is an interest when we are going to do that analysis. Why is it an interest? Since this demographic characteristics, we are going to only pick this demographic characteristic that can influence my subject of the study. Since I'm doing what you call quantitative analysis, I'm interested in my dependent variable. Can gender variability in gender change what we call the performance? Is there a significant difference between male and female in the way this organization performance in this organization? Now, is there a significant difference between male and female when it comes to performance of statistical class? Therefore, gender becomes an important variable for me to include under the attributes. We only bring these attributes that at least I suspect may bring there with the element of differences, like the education status of the rest of them. You can only put it in your questionnaire if at all you think variability in education may bring what you call differences in how answers are going to be received from what you call the rest of them. Now, it simply means, does it mean that if a person has a low level of education, his experience level with that particular subject that we are trying to survey on is going to be different with the person whose level of education has PhD level or postgraduate, or there is no variability with regard to education level, with regard to the experience of an individual with their particular subject. Is that the concern? Therefore, I will include education status as one of the components of my uh, attributes okay then attitudes these are now qualitative aspect of measurement how to feel about something that we did to them for instance in the project we implement projects and once we implement projects to uh, a given community or target group we need to go and assess their attitude with regard to the program that we gave to them yes so that's why we can be able also to analyze the attitudinal attitude opinion what people say might be true or should be done what is the opinion concerning at least the problem that has just occurred what is the opinion concerning the next general election that we are going to face what is the opinion so those are some of the aspects that we will also collect and analyze people's opinion preferences what is very important especially when you're doing surveys for marketing surveys geared towards uh, advising companies on the, the, the level of output that they need to increase so that at least the market do not have shortages. Preference, what is the people's preference? That they prefer a, this particular color of a given ingredient. That is what they prefer. What does that mean? That particular survey is just telling us that when you go and manufacture, can you ensure that these particular ingredients are more in combination as opposed to these others? That is what that particular uh, research has just believed. Then people's beliefs belief system. Now, and this belief system, what people think is true. When we design programs, we need to challenge the beliefs. If I thought those beliefs are traditional and retrogressive to development, then I design programs geared towards changing the people's beliefs, what they consider to be true. But I use knowledge and a proper approach so that by the time I'm bringing in something new to them, okay, I've already obeyed all the approaches also, first of all, I have to appreciate that their belief, what they believe. We first start by appreciating that is exactly the, 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 the best approach of changing someone is to appreciate what is doing and say this is fantastic. Oh, but then what about if you can just add something like this to this? It may be better. Look at this. You are bringing a comparative. Just trying to say that if you can add this with this belief, okay, this belief currently at least we are seeing this following problem. What about if we can uh, approach it different way? Then you stop and you allow that person to tell you. Okay, you involve an idea, but don't bring the conclusion. Allow now the conclusion to come from the other person so that at the online, now you also speak some facts about that, what is relevant, and you appreciate even every point that that particular person has already said. In the long run, if we have totally had that belief that is very progressive and it cannot come out from it, you'll realize that that particular approach will allow you to be able to do what? To collect that particular facts from that particular person. We are using what we call science, standard way 
of collecting information from the respondent and the standard way of having sense from that particular information that was collected. And that's why we are saying that now our way of approach is going to be the same all throughout. The answers that you're going to get and the answer I will get one year later will not differ so much. Then knowledge, what people know, and then behavior. Those are now qualitative aspects of our data because we said both quantitative and qualitative must be collected, and especially when we're doing what you call the evaluation. We have to use what you call mixed methods just to blend each other because each methodology has a weakness. So when you combine the two, for instance, the numeric calculations that we are going to arrive at, 0 0.6. 0 0.6, we shall be more interested if at all this 0 0.6, there's a pattern out of it. It is only the qualitative analysis that will try to explain for us the why that particular pattern is taking place. So that's why now when we are combining our methodology, we become more comprehensive, more, and then we can now have a more comprehensive report on that particular issue that we are trying to arrive at. Good. So I want now to bring you to type and source of data. I have just thought about data source is the first thing that in any learning that you are trying to begin your journey to data analysis, you must start with understanding your data sources. And then you must start by understanding now which is the best methodology to analyze this particular data source. So type and source of data, primary data, data collected for the sake of the first time you are collecting it. That's never been done before. So sources, target beneficiaries, we target direct and indirect. Key informant information, if at all we are in the field of M&E, then we collect them from farmers, leaders, our opinion leaders in the community, staff and volunteers are all key players here we collect information from. Now they're the critics of the particular project. Whatever you hear, you must go and view who are the people who are opposed to this particular idea. Now they will tell you. Now most of the people who opposed, but later they were convinced who are the following. Now you need to look for those critics so that you collect that particular information. What was the rationale of opposing this? Okay? Collaborators that we are working with the particular people, competitors, we need to get something from the competitors, okay? So now local community leaders, we collect information from them, government officials, we collect information from them, implementation sites, observ observation on what was on the ground, we also collect what is the you can be able to see and you take pictures as evidence to support this. Information from sites may also be obtained by direct observation, that's before, during the project, and after the end. So these are sources of data, especially when you use so much in the, our M and E assignment. Okay. Now types of data, secondary data. These are now existing data collected for other purposes. But then we can be able to rely on them so that we have some sense from it. Like now, press, print media, newspaper, magazines on the same same area, official budget documents, work plan, minutes of meeting visitors book, okay, survey reports, then all these are already published, they're already there. So we collect them and then try to analyze them. But, and actually this is the first procedure that we do. Even if at all you're a student, you'll realize the first procedure is to be able to come up with your literature review. Now, literature review is based on the already existing information that are there. Now, it's uh, supposed now to be taught on now, what are the best techniques by which I can have a good literature review, which is more comprehensive with regard to the particular key areas that I was examining, my variables, okay? So now, that is now the first step. If you go to an organization that you have been given a consultancy work, now, the first approach is try to identify, are they secondary data in that particular area so that you can sit down and examine have some sense, have some sense out from that particular data before you can be able to design your instrument and then collect the primary data. So both primary data and secondary data needs to be blended together in any comprehensive survey that you are going to conduct or in any assignment that is geared toward 
even soliciting information for the sake of making even the strategic plan for the organization. The approach is the same. It, there is no big difference. That's why you find that after you have undergone a research skills training, you can definitely do anything. No one can now challenge you that now you don't belong to this because of your background factors. Now you already fit to do work that can be done using scientific methodology of collecting and analyzing that particular data. Let's move now to the data management concept. Now, data management, what is it? Data management simply refers to the collection, storage, processing, dissemination, and efficient use of data. Okay, now, why do we incorporate data management? Why is this first called data management and analysis? Why is the essence that data management is very important in our department? And what is this that it involves? What are the questions that data management answer? Yes, that is the thing that we want now to discuss. What are the fundamental things, questions that data management is able to answer? Now look at number one. What is required by the regulation as far as that data is concerned? Some of the data actually are supposed to be kept in the organization for a specific period of time, since someone may require the source documents to verify. Okay? Like when you are a businessman, you are required to maintain what you call those documents for a period of seven years for any tax uh, dispute or etc. So that at least someone can come and try to verify that particular fact, whether you presented the correct report. How will a person find relevant data? How will you find relevant data from our organization? It's only when there is a proper management system of our data, that's when finding data becomes easy. And remember, even there's restriction to the access of data. Who has the password? And who has the, uh, who in absence of this person, who next has access to that particular password? How many people have that password to the data? Okay, is our data free from hacking? Is our is data free from malicious people attack intruders? Is it protected? Protection of our data. Because now we 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 are, data is the engine. This is the current engine of organizations. Okay, and as we are moving forward, you are going to find that everything, all organization system, every organization is currently is creating a department for data. And that is the only area where at least even there is a job increase. There is a lot of job increase coming up in every organization system. They are realizing the importance of what we call data. And that simply means majority of work is going to be more in future in the data. And that's why we have already started the concept of now incorporating data science in learning. Yeah, because we need those big data, those big information that we are finding. Now look at even in five seconds. If you want to collect the entire information that is being posted in, 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 in social media like Facebook uh, for one hour, one hour, you track one hour posting in Facebook entire world. And what do they post? Then we are trying to analyze that in the people's mind, when we post in the uh, Facebook, this is the area that they like posting more. And then we go even analyze again. Why do they? like this area more than others and what can we do so that we tilt this particular kind of behavior to what we want how will the data be shared after we have already analyzed the how where will the data go how will the security system of the data for the future what about the time duration of time that data will be kept in that particular system or organization? What about if in case that data, that organization has been even destroyed by things like fire and all computers burned? Do you have proper backup that can be able to make us still not lose our data? Or do you store your data in things like C, C how is it called? CD. Right? Uh, Plus disk, and then that plus disk has disappeared, and it had all the information that you, you, you require, and you even dared not to do backup in the Google Drive and any other place. Yeah, but remember when you have an important information to pass a code, it is better you use what you call email, and that document is saved in the Google Drive. Ten days 
10 years down the line, you will still realize that you are able at least to chase that particular data. I once, uh, I, 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 I once gave a report on, on some students' um, um, uh, scores in the year 2016. Yeah, 2016. But I, I forwarded the, the, the mark in our department through what you call email. Then there was an issue that erupted that some marks were even uh, changed in that particular subject. When I started looking, my computer that I had, it was kept all the information. What happened with my computer is that that computer uh, was stolen. So I had nothing. Now I'm being asked by the department to give the, 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 the original scores that I presented. I said, no, no, I had a hard copy signed and I took to the department for file. Now the filing system, there are a lot of changes they cannot be able to trace. Look at that particular, what is happening in some organization. Then it reached a moment that someone just advised me that, can you go and see which system did you use to forward? I said, go, I, I, I used actually my email. Please, can you go to Google Drive to trace that thing if at all it was even a copy was kept there? Likely enough, when I went to the Google, I found the marks for the students, all of it, the way I ordered it. And I was able to download it in Excel, the way it was, and I forwarded it again to where it was required for the decisions that they wanted to make. So I would just wonder if at all I never forwarded these copies through email and I never had the Google Drive saved. So please, anytime that you're dealing with any important document to you, even if at all it is an audio or it's a presentation that you know is very vital and it can get disappeared in the storage in the computers and anything may take place, there is a need for backup. That particular backup is being addressed during what we call data management system in our organization. So we have even also uh, 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 locations where we are keeping our data and currently we keep them in what you call, uh, 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 we can easily keep them, it's very safe. Every organization are coming up with system of how they can they keep them in the cloud. You will hardly um, uh, lose those your data. So, and that can only be addressed in this concept of data management. So, this is just a brief exercise. What is the importance of data management? So now you can just uh, answer on your own, but I want to talk to discuss some benefits why we do what we call data management. Number one, data management planning enhances data security of data in our organization. So that is the first point of the role of data management. Number two, it safeguards against data loss as storage, backups, and archiving are planned and prior and provided, like my case. And then it's also a component of compliance to the guys who entrusted you to collect data and to manage for them the department, the funders, publishers, requirements that data is safe. It complies with the, uh, the donor, even the donor requirement, quality. In general, it's enhanced as data management ensure that data and records are accurate, consistent, complete, authentic, and reliable. That's another benefit of having proper data management system in our organization. Or when you begin doing your study as researchers or students, then you start thinking about how will I be able to track and manage my data from the region where I'm collecting data from the source to where I will be keeping them before analysis is performed. Data management planning streamlines data handling and thus create efficiency gains for our organizations. And also it facilitates the handling of big data and provide access and restriction to people who should not have access. And it also now, any person that is handling this sensitive data, we have to sign what we call secrecy form with the organization that thou shall not transfer this data to our organization to the computers. If you do like that, you lose your job and we shall be able to send you home very fast. So you are make a person to commit that I once I will work with you, your data will remain safe, I will have your password and it will not share it with any other person. Because if a person gets the data from you, that person can be able even now to offer undue computation to you. Even now, 
uh, ensure that you lose your business. That's how sensitive data is. That it must be kept professionally and in a safe place and with proper backup and archiving system that can be able to support any data loss in future. Good. So we have covered just so much and then we just want to move now to the concept of data quality. Data quality, because that's what I've already said is a component of data management. When we talk about data quality, what do we mean by data quality? So data quality, data that satisfy the requirements. The requirements sometimes are called specifications. When you are in the engineering field, specification. Now, when you want to build a house, the house needs to be three bedroom house. Now you give specification for room one, room two, and room three. Where will be the door facing? What about the windows? At what length? At what height? Yes. What about the dining space? Of what of 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 of, of what uh, dimensions? Detailed. Huh? I normally use um, uh, 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 that you need to be keen to detail. Now, I, I, I normally look, I, I normally like a story, which is actually documented in some of the books. And these books, um, uh, these books are books of uh, uh, the big book that we have, one of the big books. We have two big books that we have, the Quran and also the Bible. So it's a story that is in the Bible of God giving instruction to Noah. Is what we call Noah Ark. It's a very wonderful story. Now, when I go deep to read this particular story on the specification of how the Ark was supposed to be made, then I realize that God is really detailed. He provided a complete description on even the kind of wood that was to be used for the dock, the 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 the, 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 the weight of and the dimensions, everything, how it was supposed to be built. And that actually, a full detail was already provided. So the makers for that particular app were only supposed to follow the manual that was already been provided. That's what we're calling a specification. So data that meets the specification, I will call it quality data. It's a perception or assessment of data fitness to serve its intended purpose. Good. So now we normally have around four or five dimensions of quality, which means when I want to assess quality, what should be the key when I want to assess quality? Okay, what are the, okay, data, which is, yes, we also have the five dimension of quality. I don't know why I never, I never included it in the slide, but nonetheless, I'll just talk about it. Because whenever I think about quality, what is it in data that will make it meet that quality criteria? Yeah. So I may say that now this data which is complete, that's the first one. The completeness is an aspect of quality. Data is complete. How can I be able to enhance completeness in data? Now, counter checking the data, especially when you receive it from the respondent, are all the questions being answered? And even during the time of instrument design, did all what we needed, we were looking for, included to be in the questionnaire itself. It starts from that particular point. The completeness must first be assessed during the time of the design of the instrument we are going to use to collect the data. Because now the questions, the instrument is simply like a mirror of what we want to get from this particular people. So if we don't mess up, here, we mess up putting wrong questions, then definitely we will get answers that do not reflect at all what we are looking for. So quality starts by the design. And that's why the instrument we are using must pass through steps. And one of the steps is the step of consistency and also the step of reliability. We must be able to pass through what you call reliability test and validity test, just to confirm that the data that you're working with meets specific specification necessary to give us the right information from our respondents.
So it simply, simply means there is such a must be measuring what is supposed to measure. The instrument must be measuring what it's supposed to measure. Then how then it's going to have, we are going to have a, 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 a interpretation. That is also what we call the same. So we have completeness, we have accuracy, we have reliability, we also have the fact that we have talked about uh, validity. Okay, uh, some of the domain that we want our data to fit. Okay, so I have a question. I have a kind of a small story that I will be sharing with you here. It's a kind of a case study on data. So this is how the case study goes. Assume you have been assigned to be the lead consultant for an European Union funded water project which was completed in 2019, covering 700 households in Boni area. Boni area is in Kenya. You are required to conduct an endline evaluation on the particular project, okay? Then you go outside. One of your first tasks when you are doing evaluation is to establish that all we have what you call baselines. Baselines, we are normally using it as the reference point. The, the status quo before the program started, we needed to have collected the information uh, that actually was the basis for coming up with that particular project in an area. So now, uh, in case we don't have the baseline, then we normally are uh, expected to assign a group that is going to be used as control. So that is what happened in this particular case. There is a, a group, there was assignment of the, of the target group into two groups, they were divided into two groups, the experimental group and the control group. And actually when I normally take uh, uh, my students to what you call evaluation of, uh, of a statistical test for evaluation, you, we normally adopt MAD, the so-called control. Control is used as what you call reference and then experimental. I normally, there's something I will be telling you when I come to classification of data called binary. We normally use what we call binary um, um, uh, dummy variables to code this control as zero and the experimental to be one. So that I will be running a model trying to compare the significant changes that was realized from control to experimental. In one particular model, I can be able to say this uh, uh, model, uh, this is for the control, this is for the for the, for, for the experimental group. And then I'm trying to assess in the control group, this sort was the reading in the experimental group, this was the reading. So now that change, change between the two, and then trying to establish if that change is significant or not. The first group told you that this particular water that was erected to this community actually brought some bad on men. Since they realized that after the water was uh, constructed by the NGO, what happened is that several families had some people's cases in that village. Now, the second group told you that the program implemented did a very poor work. They never involved the, 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 the local, and even the local children were not employed in the project. So definitely, the project was for the NGO, and uh, when they left, the community rejected that water source, and they, they left. So those are the kind of information that you receive on the spot. Then you as a consultant, you come down and sit in your table and try to diagonize this particular. Remember, this is what you call meet the people tour. Meeting the people tour is very important before even I sit down to design my instrument. I meet the people, just collect some views, just try to do a, a, a kind of informal uh, information gathering. That information, uh, informal information gathering is key, it's very critical yeah, for my work. I need to do a good work and therefore I need to engage in some kind of informal um, meeting the people who are, I go to the, the project leaders, uh, we just have small stories concerning the project. I go to the target group, I just have some small stories that I've not even started my work. So after that is after I've already have that view is when I come and sit down to design the instrument now to answer pertinent questions that I want to be addressed in the evaluation. Okay. Okay. That is the way we are doing with uh, 
uh, most, most of the consultants here are coming and work with you. So another term that I want just to introduce with you now, what is important here is that if you look from this, this standpoint, I can just simply tell you that now, these are data of some very low quality. Now, uh, it is my responsibility now to go and sit down and try to look at now, this might meet the people too are actually giving me some discouraging information as far as the project is concerned. So I come down and try to look at now. This target group that I rely on, what is their level of education? Can I be able to get that particular information? Now, based on if these people are very low level of education, then I will say, I will use focus group to get more information from these people. Or I will use uh, even interviews. I will not design questionnaire since I agree will not get responses because uh, this type of people, you can't give them questionnaire. They will not fail for me. Or they will not know. Some will be, do not even know how to read and write. So I also vary what you call the methodology of collecting this information from people based on general assessment that I've collected from my media people here. Another term that um, I want to introduce to you is the term significant level, because today is a matter of familiarization with the key terms in my study. Now, significant level, also known as alpha, is a measure of the strength of the evidence that must be present in order for us to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the effect is statistically significant. Yeah, so this is the meaning of significant level. And we set our significant level, the standard way of setting it, like in social science, we normally call about 5%. It's allowable risk, it's allowable error that you can work with. But when we are in what you call health sciences, we normally increase the accuracy level to 0.1%. We can only now talk about 99% confidence as opposed to 95% confidence. So the lower significant level indicates that you require stronger evidence before you will reject the null hypothesis. Now, like for instance, in medical sciences, the matter of life and death, you require stronger evidence before you can be able to reject the null hypothesis. And that is why we increase what you call our margin of error as we deal with things that is a matter of life and death, the health biological statistics, biostatistics is full of 1% uh, margin of error. The reason is, is that uh, we normally require a very strong evidence before you can really reject a child that is not yours when you go and do your DNA, because you have a confrontation that this child, the eyes and the, the ears do not look like me. So we are trying to, uh, uh, have a dispute with the wife, and then you end up that now court case wants to um, evidence in support of uh, your hypothesis. So we can simply go and do the DNA, and the DNA will come with what you call 99% 90, confidence that either this child is not yours or the child is yours. Yeah, because that is a biological issue. So we have a very, we have to collect a very strong evidence before we can say, say that this child do not belong to you. And therefore the child perhaps do not qualify to do what for your inheritance. So the mother needs to tell us the origin and so that that person you can go to collect the inheritance from that particular person. Okay. Okay. Now, what about a uh, uh, p-value? A p-value is the probability that you will obtain the effect observed in your sample. The p-values are calculated based on your sample data and under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. Yes. Then we have type one error and type two error. So type one error is the hypothesis test. Type one error occurs when you reject a null hypothesis. That is actually true. Now look at this. I reject null hypothesis, which is true. That is type one error. I accept null I accept null hypothesis, which is actually wrong. That is type two error. 
So I'm accepting what is wrong, type two. I'm rejecting what is true, it's type one error. Good. Now, any question before I can proceed, because I'm simply now going to look at, or I can move, I can move, I finish the slide as well. Now I open up for the questions, you can also write them down, then because I'm just going to what you call simple sample size calculation. Now, once I'm through with the sample size calculation, we can even end the presentation. There's no problem for that, because at least the basics in that analysis has been presented in look in plain language so since because when we go there we talk about margin of error we talk about type one error we talk about null hypothesis you already on the look of what we are referring to this is like now introduction to the language of statistics for those who are meeting these terms for the first time it's better that before we can be able to do any data analysis we introduce the code we introduce the language to be used so this is our language. So, and now, since the source of the information I will analyze is critical, and in quantitative study, I must be able to apply a systematic way of including someone into my group. Therefore, we are coming to the concept of sample size calculation. How do I determine? the right sample for my study. That's now the, this component is going to answer that. And what about if I violate collecting the right sample, what will happen? Can I proceed with doing what you call my analysis? Will it be correct? Can I generalize the information? Those are now the key questions that I will be interested in answering that now. We come to now sample size calculation. In organizations, most of the organizations currently uh, use what you call calculator to arrive at the sample size. And we go to what you call raw soft calculator. So you just go to the Google and type raw soft calculator. Then it will come. So now in the raw soft calculator, you will be asked, what is the margin of error? The margin of error simply is the significant level. This is the allowable risk. You can call it the allowable risk. And I tell you, it is not standard. Based on the kind of study that we are conducting, are we in social science or are we in the medical sciences? So I said, margin of error in medical sciences we need a strong evidence before we can be able to reject the null hypothesis. And this makes us to increase the accuracy level to 1%. But in social sciences, we allow 5% the standard. And even the system that we are going to use for doing that analysis is programmed on a default of 5%. Since most of the studies that are being done are based on social science. And therefore, the default is 5%. So in case you know the kind of study that you're conducting, then that margin of error you are going to change based on that. And it will affect the sample size. When you say that the, the, the number of people you require before you can be able to reject your null hypothesis needs to increase. And in that particular case, we shall be able now to use our study to do what you call inferential. We do what you call a projection. Then confidence level and then population size. If you don't know the population size, because sometimes you may not have what you call, uh, uh, um, if you don't know population size, you are going to find in the system, they will have a default of 20,000. So you can rely on that. Okay, so uh, 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 I will take you to the practical approach of how you can arrive at this in the system. And uh, uh, after, I think I just need to uh, take you, leave the PowerPoint before I can be able to proceed to Chromans, um, uh, where the target population is not known, because we also have an instance where the target population is not known. I want to arrive at, let me just be through with this part. Target population is not known. Now, um, you don't know the target population, then you use this formula. 
Now, this formula is n sample size is equal to z squared, where z is 1.96, the z value. So you square the 1.96, and then there is what you call p and then q. Where p and q, p simply represent, p simply represent uh, what we normally call as, uh, we normally call as the, like for instance, right now we are talking about mapping about COVID prevalent. That is P is actually called the prevalent. Now the prevalent of that particular thing that we are measuring in that area. So this prevalent is a statistical information that's arrived at and being calculated, especially in most of the health sciences like prevalent of malaria, prevalent of HIV AIDS, prevalent of uh, tuberculosis. We normally have this statistic in, in health departments in every country. So if we are doing a survey in that particular area, then you wanted to use this Coleman's formula, then definitely you need to use that particular prevalent rate. So if it is 60%, then you simply come here and put here 0 0.6. But in case you don't know the prevalent rate, you have no information as far as prevalent is concerned of that particular study that you are conducting, then you are allowed to assume 50%. Like this case, I'm making assumption that it's 50%. It's not known. The prevalent of that particular thing we are trying to measure is also not known. Now, if that is the case, then you divide by what you call the margin of error is raised to power square. So margin of error is down. So this is the formula that is used when the target population is not known. Now, in that my case, I have 384 sample size. But then the sample size. There's something that at least, if you look at most of the studies that even especially most of the students are doing, uh, a mistake that they're doing is that when they arrive at the sample size, they end up using that sample size to, to make the number of questionnaires that they want to distribute to the respondents, not taking into consideration the so-called non-response. Now look at this. For statistical significance, or for more accurate in terms of the sample, I require 384 respondents to do my analysis. Now, it's most likely that I may not get 384. There may be chances of some non-response. But I require 384. So what do I do? So you must be able to take into cognizance the fact of the non-response. Where do we get non-response rate? That's another question. So non-response is a, an issue of an estimate, and it's based on the various other people who have done studies in that particular area, we work about the average. So I need to study Tom, did the study in 1999, and the particular subject that I'm studying today with the same target group, but then the non-response was 20%. When another guy did the same study, and response was 15%. So if I get the same people who did particular studies, I can be able to establish the non response and add and get the average. And I can use that as my non response adjustment rate. We adjust for non response because most likely that particular percentage will not respond to that particular survey. But in all, whether they respond or they don't respond, I require 384 perhaps. So that I can be able to do what I can be able to rely on that sample so that to make my accurate prediction. So if at all it's not, then I have to adjust. And how do I adjust? It's a matter of um, sample size calculated divided by non-response it will give me the adjusted sample size. Is what now I need to work for. And that's merely the end. Now this is one of what you call the the area that I, I wanted to talk about, I, I was supposed to bring to the other side. These are now the, the, the dimension of quality, the relevance, timeliness, validity, uniqueness, accuracy, completeness, and then consistency. These are under explanation for here. So when you receive this PowerPoint, you are going to be able to explain it very, very well. So I just want to move straight to data ethics. Data ethics is very important, especially in, uh, in most of the studies that are being conducted. Okay? And there are three areas that we need to tie when we talk about data ethics. 
So what is data ethics? Ethics is the principle that guides morally correct behavior and actions in every study. This means that if we try to make just and positive solutions, we can only do it through ethical choices. So one of the ethical choices is that before you can be able to get information from a person, please get consent. If that particular person is not authorized to have a consent like a child, then please get the consent of the parents. It's ethical that way. Violation of that can lead even to a court case of collecting information from someone's child. It's unethical. The next part is that when we collect information from the respondent, please let us not identify them with their own names. Since that may bring a conflict and we'll make extra information that we are going to look for in that community, people will not fear giving us information since they know the information can be traced with them. And therefore we require the respondent to be kept anonymous. Next ethical concern is that thou shall not take a job which you don't know and you cannot be able to do well. That is called technical competence. It's unethical for you to take a job which you cannot be able to do. It's unethical for you to cheat an organization that you can be able to deliver this project well. When on the other hand, you don't know. You don't know it. Then you come up with like the data analysis component. So many people take jobs, but if after doing the data analysis, you see the kind of presentation they're making, it will make the organizations to nullify everything and then hire another person again, a waste of money and a waste of resources. So in that case, please do not take a job which you are not competent, you can never deliver. It's unethical. If you can't, they look for the right person who can be able to do it for you. Those are now ethical area, compromise. And then also, if at all you have a, what you call interest in what you want to report on, please do not participate. Conflict of interest. So we don't. Those are other component of what you call an ethical behavior in research that must be avoided. And approvals is also a component that we must only begin once we have already satisfied that we have an, a, enough approval that is required. Meeting the university senate requirement at the same time, the government requirement of consent. We must combine the two so before we can be able to begin a study collecting information from someone else. Good. So after that, I come just to tell you that ensure all participants give informed consent. Let participants not suffer as a result of your data being collected. Consider experience of people you are collecting information from before you can do this. And this will also make you have a different research design or the instrument you're going to use must also take consideration of the experience and education level of the respondent. Identify and avoid potential areas where your data may exhibit existing inequality. Now, for instance, you go to collect data in an area, but you're just concerned about collecting data from the people who are staying in near the roads. Or you are just concerned about women that are at least very rich. They are the ones that you are going to collect data from. That particular data will only be catering for the rich people. This means the data collection is, is used as a, a, a means of widening the inequality. It will not be like that. It's unethical that we only collect data from near the people of our convenience. For us to be able to give a proper report, let's leave our convenience aside and go to that particular area, even the interior part, so that we collect information. Because remember, we want to assist those people. So you can never assist them if you don't have a comprehensive view of how that particular issue is affecting them. At all times, ensure your participant data is kept anonymous and confidential and uphold to what you call secrecy as much as possible. Honesty is key. Do not receive like this and manipulate for your interest. Conflict of interest, ensure that you have the cultural and technical skills to carry out the processes that you want. If not, decline not to check the job. Competence is required. Provide skilled professional services, never compromise. Ensure that you have the cultural and technical competence required. So that's what. Then my final thing is this now, data classification. After data classification, I will stop there now.
data classification. Now, data is broadly classified. Data is broadly classified into two broad categories. Data is broadly classified into two broad categories. This broad category, the first one is called numeric, which means the data we are collecting from the respondent will come in numbers. Now, the data that comes in numbers are the ones that will support our quantitative analysis. This data that comes in number are subdivided into two subgroups. The first one is called discrete variables. Now, the discrete variables are the numbers, the responses that take form of whole number. Like for instance, how many children do you have? Even if at all, by the time you're being asked that question, you just gave birth yesterday night. You will say, I have three children. The one that born yesterday should be included as a whole number. Human beings. Animals that you keep is the answer will be whole number. Money that you have, the answer is whole number. Since all those we can say are countables. So discrete variables are countable. All countables are called discrete. While all measurables are called continuous variables. So majority of continuous variables, the answer response come in decimal places. Like right now, when you go to any building, they take their temperature. So that we try to assess whether you have COVID or not. Are you COVID free or you are COVID positive? So we take temperature. So that temperature, 36.4, 35.6. So it is, in, it, 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 it is in what you call uh, uh, with decimals. It's a measurable quantity. Weight, height, even your age is a measurable quantity. It's not a whole number. So when somebody asks you about age, you just approximate that I'm 44, I'm 44 years. You can never be 44 years. Since definitely age cannot take the form of a whole number. It is a continuous variable. By the time you even talk about your age, there are some seconds that have already even passed. And then you have ignored the, the months, you have ignored you, all those weeks and even the hours you ignore. So if you factor all those in presenting your age, that's why we're calling that age can never be a whole number. It must be a continuous variable with decimals. That now you can be able to understand why we don't say age is a, a discrete variable. It's just people's, people are using age 40 years, 40 years, no. It must be 40 point something. Yeah? Because these are continuous variables that you cannot believe and arrive at what you call a whole number for it. Then after that, after presenting that, based on the data that we are calling as interval and ratio scale, in the species that we are going to do, it's called scale variable. So there are two types of scale variable. So interval scale, where zero has a meaning. For instance, you are measuring temperature, you have zero degrees Celsius, it has a meaning. It simply means the level of mercury in that measurement. But it does not mean lack of. So when it is an element where zero is representing lack of, like zero amount of money in my bank account, that is lack of. If it is lack of, that is a ratio scale. If zero, zero degrees Fahrenheit, the quantity I'm measuring with regard to a mercury, good. Then what about the last one? The last one is, that is the classification that we want. Then finally, we have categorical variables, which subdivided to three, two categ three categories. The first one is called binary. Yes, no, positive, negative. Then after that, we have ordinal measurement. We have ordinal measurement, ordinal, ranked responses, like highest level of education. Education is an ordinal measurement because we are ranked response. You can simply put a quantity of this lowest, this is the highest. A look at scale. In the scale of one to five, tell us the performance of your president from the time he came into government. Then I will say, I can give the president a four. It simply means good. Now I can rank those responses, that is ordinal measurement. Then finally, we have what you call nominal measurement. What is nominal measurement? Nominal variable is where we are dealing with what's called descriptives. 
description. We are giving a number, it's only mere descriptive. Like for instance, we are dealing with admission number of students in a university. Now, admission number is an identifier. We are using it as identification. Numbers are used as identification purposes. That is a nominal variable. Now, now, for instance, we are talking about type of religion of the respondent. Then I say one Muslim, two Christian, Hindu, uh, three uh, Buddhist, uh, four. Then atheist, five. Now it doesn't mean by giving Muslims one, Muslim is now better than any other religion. Number cannot be used for comparison purposes. Number is merely an issue of identification. And we don't even use what you call, uh, we don't, we don't, we, we, we don't uh, uh, present those numbers in terms of, uh, uh, for, in terms of reporting, in terms of uh, using what you call trend attendance, like even me now. We simply require about frequency. How many people who are Hindu? How many people who are, who, are, who are belonging to this particular class? How many people were Christian? How many people were what were Muslim? That is the report that we expect to see there. And then you can support that using what you call um, uh, visual, using back, background. That's enough. That's enough. People like that. Frequency alone is enough and background is enough to present that kind of nominal variables. So once you already known that particular kind of classification, that is how that analysis will be influenced, which means data that we're going to analyze is going to be influenced on the level of scale measurement of that particular response, the way we receive it from the respondent. Is it an ordinal measurement? Is it nominal measurement? Is it binary? Or is it a ratio scale? Or is it interval scale? Or that is, once you've written on that, that is very key. Good. So now we can stop there and then I stop my recording so that we can now allow you to answer questions before we can be able to.